Wow. Hey, much love and respect. How you guys doing today? Thanks for uh, tuning in once again. How'd you guys like that uh, little intro? Showing us the Europeans, right? That they never really showed us in school. It's just something I wanted to do before we started this video today regarding the Sephardic Jews and the Moors and these European colonists that were coming in colonial times and basically establishing the 13 colonies right and again these were people of color so again just wanted to give a quick perspective again we've gone over this information in past videos my Swarti Europe Aboriginal inhabitant series we know who the Huguenots are the Protestants the Sephardic and Moorish people of Europe and we're, today we're gonna get into the role uh, a lot of these people played in the uh, foundation or the colonization of Pennsylvania and also their relation to Quakers right we've already read it before Quakers a lot of those were ex you know Sephardic Jews ex Muslim Moors they were crypto Christians or so-called Quakers again shout out to everybody that's tuned in and if you're in the live chat shout out to you right now thanks for being here so again, wanted to show all those images. Let's not forget, you know, a lot of the people just, you know, saying I'm generalizing and trying to make everybody so-called black, but I'm not the one who painted all those family crests. All right, that's history. Those are facts. If you want to practice cognitive dissonance, that's your choice. But we deal with facts here, historical facts, real genealogy, not opinions. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let's go ahead and start. Hawa. Right. And this is a genealogical history, Jews and Muslims in British colonial America. Jews and Muslims in British colonial America. You see these two symbols right here. And then you see the tree signifying a family tree. 
a branch of genealogy. And you can interpret it however you want. This is by Elizabeth Hirschman and Donald Yates. Very good informative book, very scholarly, a lot of sources to verify the information. In this work, we present a series of colonial documents, contemporary first-hand accounts, records, portraits, family genealogies, and ethnic DNA test results, which fundamentally challenge the national storyline depicting America's first settlers as white British and Christian, all right? They weren't white or British or Christians. All right, you guys ready? We postulate that many of the initial colonists were of Sephardic Jewish and Muslim Moorish ancestry, all right? Correlating with everything we're learning, right? Usually arriving as crypto Jews with their religious adherents disguised as crypto Muslims, all right? Disguised as crypto Muslims. Moors. These immigrants served in prominent economic and political, financial and social positions in all of the original colonies. A case will be made here for crypto Jewish and crypto Muslim presence in British North America. We propose that many of the initial colonists in Virginia, all right, many of the initial colonists in Virginia, South Carolina, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Maryland were of Jewish and Moorish descent. As Protestantism swept across Western Europe, many of these Jewish conversos and moriscos became often only outwardly Protestant. What? All right. Again, let me highlight that. Many of the Jewish conversos and moriscos became often only outwardly Protestant. Huguenots, new Christians, all right. Swelling the ranks of the dissenters, some even provided leaders for the Huguenots, Hussites, Anabaptists, Calvinists, German Reformed, Walloons, Mennonites, Dunkards, Quakers, Puritans, and Presbyterians. All these people, possible connection, strong connection to Jewish conversos and Moriscos, Moors. When the British, Dutch, and French began establishing colonies on the Atlantic seaboard, they sent as colonists not subjects of high political and social rank from their respective countries, but for the most part recently arrived patently anti-Catholic, newly minted Protestants. Many were debtors, prisoners, or servants, indentured, right? Cast outs of society who were struggling to get onto their own feet in a new country. Says here. All right, so again, we're about to get into the new information here. To a different chapter of this book. The book again is Jews and Muslims in British Colonial America, a genealogical history. Fair use. We go to chapter six. Again, make sure to catch the previous presentations. We've gone over all the previous chapters and uh, preface and introduction of this book, and we've used it in reference to many other uh, subjects and, and many other videos as well. So make sure to catch that if you're new. We're going to read today chapter 6. says here, Pennsylvania, Quakers, and other friends. That's how they were referring to themselves, these friends, right? Um, want to make sure, you know, we're always going to touch the hijack. We're going to pull out the babies, you know, chew the meat, spit out the bone. Sometimes we get in the mind of a hijack when we're reading these things. You know, they have their authors and stuff and their opinions with certain things. But we pull out the babies and also... We just be careful with the whitewashed images, right? Because we understand how they be whitewashing everything and how they try to deceive. Because when we think of colonial Pennsylvania, the images that come to mind are William Penn dressed in his sober black hat and cloak and congregations of Quakers or the Society of Friends sitting on wooden pews in their planned houses of worship or we may conjure up scenes of earnest Pennsylvania Dutch farmers recently emigrated from the German Palatinate. All right. Well, we understand who the, those Dutch and these German Palatinates are. A lot of those are people of color, mostly. Using immigration records, church roles, and family genealogies, we are going to paint a different picture of colonial Pennsylvania, one that includes many settlers of Sephardic, and Ashkenazic, Jewish, Ottoman, Turkish, and other types of Moorish 
Moorish, Moors, Moorish descent. We are going to argue that prior historians have inadvertently overlooked or perhaps purposely, all right, I would say purposely, all right, again, purposely ignored evidence that many of the Protestant sects arriving in Pennsylvania, example, the Mennonites were crypto Jewish, all right, who's these crypto Jews, Sephardic people of color, so-called Negro, again, Protestants was just a tag, Who's these so-called Protestants, protests, and the Catholics? All right, so these crypto-Jewish congregations led by a rabbinical-styled minister. We will provide detailed genealogies of specific families to document endogamy across generations, one of the marks of a crypto-Jewish community. Deconstructing Penn. Little is known about the early life of William Penn. William Bird of Virginia, a contemporary, wrote that he was a randy young man who got an aristocrat's daughter pregnant, not marrying her or legitimizing their child, and who then turned publicly to religion as a way of salvaging his reputation. We should perhaps be a bit circumspect in taking Penn's declarations of Christian seal at face value. Although Penn today is perceived as a champion of the oppressed and impoverished, he was in actuality wealthy and from a privileged family. His first known ancestor was John Penn, or Penny, born in Gloucestershire, England, in 1500. And it says here, Penn genealogy. John Penn was born 1500, Minity, Gloucestershire, England, and died in 1550 in Minty, Gloucestershire. Gloucestershire, England, sorry. Children, William Penn, that was his son, was born in 1525 in Mininty, Gloucestershire, England, and died on 12 March 1591 in Minty as well. William must have been quite an important figure, for when he died in 1591, it is believed that he was buried in front of the altar of St. Leonard's Church in Minty. A plaque commemorating his life was erected in the church. All evidence of this was destroyed during repairs and alterations at the turn of the 19th, 20th centuries. William Penn was born 1548, lived in Bristol, Gloucester, England, and died on 12 March 1610 in Malesbury, Minty, Gloucestershire, England. William married Margaret Russell in 1570. Margaret was born in 1547, 1556, lived in Bristol, uh, Gloucester, England. It's the daughter of John Russell and Anne George. William was a law clerk at Malmesbury, Malmesbury, Wiltshire, and chief clerk to counselor at law, Christopher George. It says here, children, George Penn was born 1571 and lived in Burnham, Sussex, England, and died in the 4th of November, 1632, while living in Plymouth. Giles Penn was born 1573 and died 1641 to 1656 and Fex or Morocco. He died in Morocco, all right? A Penn dying in Morocco. An ancestor to William Penn, all right? What's he doing in Morocco? Now, continuing, it says, on December 28, 1635, 36, Charles I, King of England, with the advice of Captain Rainsborough and Giles Penn, remember, Giles Penn is the guy who died in Morocco, made the decision to besiege the pirates in port in Morocco. Rainsborough departed with four ships, February 20, 1636, 37, upon departure, the instructions were to take all Turkish frig frigates and block up the port of Sa Sally or Saye in Morocco. They destroyed 28 ships and hemmed in the port. The governor of the port began to lend assistance and the port was delivered into Rainsborough's hands, July 28, 1636. All right, this is an ancestor of William Penn. There was an alliance formed with King Charles I, and a treaty was reached ensuring that the Moroccans never infested the English ports again. You see this? The treaty with King Charles, the Moroccans. Initially, 300 English, with a question mark, we don't know, so-called English, most likely cryptos, captives were handed over to the English forces, all right? So these were captives, all right? They were handed over to who? English forces, so-called English. Captain Carteret promptly returned to England with the newly freed British. 
Rainsboro State, he continued to try and free another a thousand captives who had been sold to Tunis and Algiers. Who? English, British, what? British, right? British people being sold to where? Tunis and Algiers, North Africa. Who are these so-called British people being sold over there? Rainsboro returned to England with the new ambassador, November 5th, 1636, 37. A procession at night with much pomp was noted to have taken place. Captive English and Irish, all right? Again, captive English and Irish, not Africans, who were missing as long as 30 years were finally returned to their homeland. After 30 years in North Africa? The capture and return of English and Irish is noted in various literature of the time. Henry F. Waters and Genealogical Gleanings in England in 1901 notes a sermon found in Oxford's uh, records by the Reverend Charles Fitz Jeffrey of St. Dominic in Plymouth, taken from the Hebrew 13.3. Remember them that are in bonds, as bond with them, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. The sermon titled Compassion Towards Captives, chiefly towards our brethren and countrymen who are in such miserable bondage and barbary. Waters also recollect another document from the same period as reading. It is certainly known that there are five Turks in the Severn, where they weekly take English or Irish, and there are a great number of their ships in the channel upon the coast of France and Biscay. All right. So you hear everything that's going on, all this history. They never really mentioned to us all these English and Irish being sent to North Africa. Anyone that says genealogical racer of Plymouth families, page 28, says Admiral Sir William Penn was born 23rd of April, 1621 in St. Thomas Parish, Bristol and died on 16 September 1670 in Wanstead, Essex. He was the son of Giles Penn and Joanne Gilbert, all right, the Gilberts and the Penns. Admiral Sir William married Margaret Jasper. Margaret was born 1624 in England. At the time of her marriage to William Penn, Margaret was a Dutch widow, so-called Dutch, having been married to Nicasius van der Schurt. Margaret van der Schurt was the daughter of Jean Johan John Jasper, merchant of Rotterdam, and Alet Plitges, whose family was from Camden, Prussia. Children, so their children, says William Penn Jr., was born 28th of October, 1644. William is known as the founder of Pennsylvania, right? So this is the William, you know, the famous William Penn, all right? Also known as a famous Quaker for his great treaty with Delaware. He was in Pennsylvania, he means with the Indians, the Delaware, the Napi Delaware. He was in Pennsylvania only three and a half years. All right, he was only there three years, but from 1681, when he received the King's Charter at the age of 37 to 1718, when he died, Pennsylvania was one of his chief preoccupations. The growth and well-being of his colony was based on tradition of religious toleration and freedom under law fundamental principles of American civil life. Thomas Jefferson called Penn the greatest lawgiver the world has produced. In 1681, there came a golden opportunity to make his dreams come true. King Charles II, out of a regard to the memory and merits of his late father, gave the younger Penn a huge tract of land in North America and named it in honor of the Admiral Pennsylvania or Penn's Woods. Examining the genealogical chart provides some significant clues as to Penn's ethnic ancestry. First, his earliest ancestor can be traced to only 1500, and by the mid-1500s had moved to that hotbed of crypto-Judaism, Bristol, England, all right? Bristol, England, a place where a lot of crypto-Jews are. Okay, all right, so remember this book I've shown you guys before. It says here, the black population of Bristol in the 18th century. The black population of Bristol, all right? We're talking about Bristol, a haven for crypto Jews. We're going to go back to the book where it's letting us know that 
his ancestors had made it all the way to Bristol, right? A hotbed for crypto Judaism. The family married into the Gilbert and Rastel families, the former of which may have been of Jewish descent. By the fifth generation, we encounter a girl, Christian Penn, born 1606, who married Francis Eaton, a Mayflower passenger in Massachusetts. Christian later married Francis Bellington, by whom she had a daughter, Martha, who married back into the Eaton family, Elizabeth, who married a Patty Sephardic surname of Providence, Rhode Island, the Bristol of the Colonies, Rebecca and Mary, who married Samuel Salsh, Jewish surname, and Rekoboff, Massachusetts. A grandson married Hannah Glass, Jewish surname. William Penn's father, Admiral Sir William Penn, was born in Bristol, England, and married a widow, Margaret Jasper, Sephardic surname. All right. So William Penn, his dad, was living in Bristol. A, again, a hotbed for crypto Jews, Moorish people from Siberia, who was the daughter of a Dutch merchant. All right. So Jasper, Margaret Jasper, was the daughter of a Dutch merchant. <laughs> And we already know who the merchants are. We already know who the Dutch are too. A lot of these Dutch, especially these Dutch merchants from Rotterdam, another hotbed for cryptos, Jews, and had been married to Nicasius van der Schur. Nicasius being a Greek shortened form of Nicholas, also the capital of Cyprus. We would not expect to see this type of marriage patterns unless the family was self-consciously attempting to perpetuate a crypto-Jewish tradition all right they don't just marry anybody is what he's saying the pens if we look at some of william Penn's writings to his financial backers and his family we can detect other signs of judaism in the constitution for the colony of pennsylvania penn states in title 12 that this government may appear equal in itself and agreeable to the wisdom god gave unto moses and the practice of our best ancestors and that we may avoid heart burnings in families and the foundation of much misery and beggary or worse. I do for me and mine hereby declare and establish for the 12 fundamental of the government of this province that what is state every person dying has in it through he or she die elsewhere, having children shall be equally shared after such persons deceased among the children of the said person saying only that the eldest, if the firstborn shall have, accordingly to the law of God by Moses, given to the Jews a double portion for his inheritance and not otherwise. Penn not only adheres to Mosaic law and inheritance bequests, but also appears to state that he and his ancestors were of the original covenant with God. Example, Jews, right? Or Hebrews, right? So Penn is basically hinting that. That's what he's saying. In later portion of the Constitution, he alludes to the Jewish religious notion of the coming of the second Adam, or Adam Kedman, as the Lord from heaven. Daily experience tells us that the care and regulation of many other affairs, more soft than daily necessary, make up much of the greatest part of government, and which must have followed the people of the world had Adam never fallen, and will continue among men or earth under the highest attainments they may arrive at by the coming of the blessed second Adam, the Lord from heaven, thus much of government in general as to its rights and end. All right. This is from Penn's words, right? It may be significant that Penn speaks of the second Adam, not as Jesus Christ, but as a Messiah whose coming lies in the remote future. To attract financial backing for the Pennsylvania colony, Penn established the Free Society of Traders in 1682. This organization received 20,000 acres called the Manor of Frank Freeman House and recruited craftsmen, tradesmen for the colony. The principals in the society included several persons we would propose based on their surnames and occupations were of Sephardic descent. And whereas I have my several indentures all right, indentures of lease barren date, the two and twentieth, and of release barren are the three and twentieth day of the first month called March, in the four and thirteenth year of the said now king's reign, granted unto Nicholas Moore of London, medical doctor James Claypool, merchant Philip Ford or Faree, he's a Huguenot, the Fords, 
are Huguenots goes back to Faure, William Shartlow of London, merchants, Edward Pierce of London, leather seller, John Simcock and Thomas Brassey of Cheshire, Yeoman, Thomas Barker of London, wine cooper, and Edward Brooks Baruch of London, Baruch blessed, grocer, and their heirs to the use of themselves and their heirs and the science, 20,000 acres of land, parcel of the said province of Pennsylvania, and trust nevertheless for the free society of traders in Pennsylvania and their successors, as soon as the said free society should be by me incorporated or erected, as in by the said indentures, relation being thereunto had more fully does appear. All right, so this includes with indentures. Many, if not most, of these names of merchants appear to have Hebrew roots. All right, these merchants, who's the merchants? We already broke this down many times before. Although few letters survive from Penn to his wife and children, biographer Jean R. Soderland does reprint one from 1682 that reads in part, Remember your creator in the days of your Jew. It was the glory of Israel and the second of Jeremiah. And how did God bless Joshua? Because he feared him in his youth. And so he did Jacob, Joseph, and Moses. Oh, my dear children, remember and fear and serve him who made you and gave you to me and your dear mother, that you may live to him and glorify him in your generations. Remember David, who asked in the Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Answers, he that walks uprightly, works righteousness, and speaks the truth in his heart, in whose eyes the vile person is condemned, but honors them who fear the Lord. In your families remember Abraham, Moses, and Joshua, their integrity to Hawa, and do as you have them for your examples. Let the fear and service of the living God be encouraged in your houses, and that plainness, sobriety, and moderation in all things, as becomes God's chosen people. And as I advise you, my beloved children, do you counsel yours if God should give you any? Yeah, I counsel and command them as my posterity that they love and serve Kawa with upright heart, that he may bless you and yours from generation to generation. All right? Again, that's from William Penn. He's writing that to his family, right? He's mentioning who? Moses, Abraham, and Joshua. Hebrew stuff, right? So it says here, the same letter continues, right? So it continues. We're going to read it, all right? Again, this is what William Penn wrote, primary source. Oh, the Lord is strong God, and he can do whatever he pleases. And though men consider it not, it is the Lord that rules and overrules in the kingdoms of men. And he builds up and pulls down. I, your father, am the man that can say, he that trusts in the Lord shall not be confounded. But God in due time will make his enemies be at peace with him. If you thus behave yourselves and so become a terror to evildoers and praise to them that do well, God, my God, will be with you and wisdom and sound mind and make you blessed instruments in his hand for the settlement of some those desolate parts of the world which my soul desires above all worldly honors and riches, both for you that go and you that stay, you that govern and you that are governed, that in the end you may be gathered with me to the rest of God. Finally, my children, love one another with a true and endeavored love and your dear relations on both sides and take care to preserve tender affection in your children to each other, often marrying within themselves, so long as it be without the bounds forbidding in God's law that so they may not, like the forgetting and unnatural world, grow out of kindred and as old as strangers, but as become a truly natural and Christian stock. You and yours, after you, may live in the pure and fervent love of God toward one another, as becomes brethren in the spiritual and natural relation. So my God that has blessed me with his abundant mercies, both of this and other and better life, be with you all, guide you by his counsel, bless you, and bring you to his eternal glory, that you may shine, my dear children, in the firmament of God's power, with the blessed spirits of the just, the celestial family, praising and admiring him, the God, the father of it, forever and ever. For there is not God like unto him, the God of Abraham, 
of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of the prophets, the apostles, the martyrs, and Jesus in whom I live forever. All right. So he says, so farewell to my thrice dearly beloved wife and children, yours as God pleases, in that which no waters can quench, no time forget, nor distance wear away, but remains forever. William Penn. All right. In the tradition of Presbyterian reformer, John Knox, Penn, and many other Quakers, despite the use of Jesus' name. They despite the use of Jesus' name. I wonder why. May well have been of Sephardic and perhaps Moorish leanings. All right? Moorish leanings. Sephardic and Moorish leanings. The reader will note that the theology he teaches to his children is grounded in the Hebrew Torah, not the Christian New Testament. Penn describes his ancestors and current family, not as like the children of Israel, but as being the children of Israel. We inter interpret this text as overly stating that the Penn family is of Jewish Hebrew descent, in fact, not in a metaphorical sense. This is the reason why he admonishes his children to marry with their close kin, not merely with other Christians or even Quakers, in order to preserve unadulterated their direct heritage from the Jewish patriarchs and matriarchs. Penn's position is directly analogous to that of Moriscos, all right, Moriscos, Morisco, during the 1560-1715 period in Spain, a Mufti religious leader, and one fatwa, responsum, legal opinion, composed specifically to answer the quandaries faced by crypto Muslims living in Christian Spain during those times. Wrote, if they oblige you, this is Penn telling his family, giving them advice about what they should do, because they're being secret Muslims, secret Jews, if they oblige you to give your daughters in marriage to them, then you should cleave firmly to the belief that it's forbidden. When you not under duress and abhor it in your hearts so that you would do otherwise if you were able. Such a position to marry an outside Islam was founded on belief that Muslims could trace their descent back to an Arab tribe. Companion of the Prophet, Emir of or Caliph, Appendix C, Muslim Rituals and Beliefs, the children of the prophet, as much as the children of Israel, were quite literally a bloodline, one that must not be adulterated. The Spanish Catholics, of course, had their own obsession with ethnic exclusivity, limpieza de sangre, purity of blood. But this differed by not being tied to the concept of deep ancestry and distant genealogies. Clearly, Penn was not following the Christian model. In 1683, letter to Jasper Bat, Greek Hebrew surname and given name, a Quaker minister, Penn writes, that the entailment of the government of this province may be to David's stock, the tribe of Judah. I close with thee with all my heart, but tell me how that shall be. It has been the earnest desire of my soul that it might ever anchor there. Show us the way, and thou shalt be the man. The power I have my patents runs thus, and I and my heirs, with the assent of the freemen, of their deputies, from time to time, may make laws so long as they be not repugnant to the allegiance we owe to the kings as sovereigns. Once again, this passage does not appear to be intended as metaphor, but rather as an ancestral assertion that is Pennsylvania is intended to be a community of Davidic descended Jews like medieval Narbonne in chapter two that we read. All right. So this is deep, man. Letting you know they were this is what Penn's idea he was trying to establish in this area called Pennsylvania, this colony they gave him. All right. A community of Davidic descent. Huh? Who lived in Pennsylvania? Let's now take a look at who arrived to settle the new Israel of Penn's woods. The standard histories of Pennsylvania stress that due to the colony's liberal ordinances on religion, settlers came who were not only Quakers, but also adherents of several other religious sects from a variety of countries. Unlike South Carolina and Rhode Island, however, Pennsylvania on paper at least 
seem to limit settlers to Christians. We will now document through colonists, surnames, and genealogies that despite being from a diverse cross-section of semen Christian sects and denominations, the majority of early Pennsylvanians were actually of Judaic descent, all right? In keeping with Penn's sentiments. But before doing so, it is important for us to review some of the essential facts relating to Quakerism and its founder, the English dissenter George Fox. All right, this is a very interesting part. It says regarding this guy here, there are indications that Fox family were rather recent immigrants to Lake Lake Hasser, where he was born. The Fox surname was not rooted in England, but rather in Ireland. All right, Fox, Fox News, right? Fox, a translation of Gaelic Sionach and Germany's Fuchs, a common Sephardic name. All right, Fuchs, Sionach, combination, Sephardic name. George Fox's mother was Mary Lago. All right, very important. And some say she's related to the Trumps. All right, Mary Lago, the name of a Jewish family denounced to the Inquisition of Lisbon around 1580. You hear that? So the Inquisition, the Catholics were after her family, the Lagos, all right, who is the mother of the founder of Quakerism. Okay, George Fox. Now, says he later referred to his mother's origins as the stock of the martyrs. Evidently, a gloss on the Mediterranean background she shared with the earliest saints of the Catholic Church. He married Margaret Askew, or Askoff, Hebrew, the widow of Thomas Fell, Sephardic surname. Growing up, he attended a local Presbyterian church, although it is not clear exactly when the new movement crystallized. Some say in 1648. In 1650, Fox was imprisoned for blasphemy. During the trial, a judge mocked Fox's ex exhortation to tremble at the word of the Lord, calling him and his followers Quakers or Quackers. Quackers. This was the source of the common name of the Society of Friends. That's when it all started. Before they were known as children of the light. As for the word friends, Muslims believed they could be a friend of God and regarded all other Muslims as brothers. All right, this is deep. Listen to where they're getting all these terms from the origin of these Quakers, right? The Friends, Society of Friends. Fox became a radical preacher in and out of jail before securing an, an ethic of tolerance for Quakers in 1689, partly through the intercession of William Penn, whom he had met at the beginning of his career. Fox traveled extensively in the various American colonies and America increasingly emerged as the promised land in the eyes of Quakers, right? So what was America in the eyes to these Quakers who were actually Hebrews? This was the promised land. Now, they knew this was the promised land. It wasn't emerging. It was actually they had come over here because they knew this was the promised land. This is they took a pilgrimage, Puritan. They took a pilgrimage over here. They knew this was the promised land these Quakers. The sect thrived there. It spread like wildfire with more and more meetings, congregations branching off from each other. A division was made between birthright friends and convinced friends. The former were Quakers born into families that were members of a friend's meeting, while the latter were latecomers who professed the religion and converted to Quakerism without this blood ties to members. In this, we can see some of the same Jewish and Muslim thinking described above, as well as the traditional Jewish distinction between Jews descended from the patriarchs, the Kohanim and Levites, and the children of Israel, seen as having adoptive or undetermined ancestors. All right, that's very interesting. Also, these meetings, these Quaker meetings, just I quickly just remembered as I'm doing genealogy, run into a lot of these Quaker meeting notes and uh, genealogical records. Very interesting. A lot of black folks that I've done genealogy for, I find they're Quakers and, you know, they come out in these records. Appendix H present the surnames in the Bucks County Quaker record, volume two, by 
Wartring and Wright, which we believe stem from or are related to Jewish surnames and given names. Let's consider why this may be the case. Now it says here Adams, Adam, Adams is a Hebrew surname, quite plainly. It has become naturalized as English Christians because two American presidents' cousins bear the name. Yet it would be more historically sensible to consider that Adams' presidents were likely of Jewish descent than to assume, as has generally been done, that the Adams' surname is Christian. In the case of this specific Quaker family in Pennsylvania, the use of Talmudic rabbinic names such as Ephraim would seem to be further evidence of crypto-Jewish practice. Alexander, says here, Alexander was one of the most common Jewish surnames of the medieval period. Esther is a deeply Jewish name for women, often used in Orthodox families. Armour, Ames, Bagley. These three surnames are French, Jewish, Armour, Ames, Amour, right, Amour, and Turkish, Bagley, respectively. Bailey, this surname is found on the French Huguenot list, all right, Bay, Bailey, French Huguenot list, as is Barry. Further, the Bailey family and Betulia Barry carry distinctly Hebrew Aramaic names. Example, Betulia is Hebrew for virgin, Tamer, date palm, Tamari, Tamer, date palm. Beers, Beers, Berder like members of these two families carry Hebrew Talmudic names. Example, Elhana, Robena, female for Reuben, Jael. Female, goat, Buckham. This is very common Ashkenazic surname. Note the very unusual Hebrew given names. Example, Abdon, Malon, Pinchos. Lydia is a Greek given name favored by medieval Jews. Bunton. Here we see the use of given names that are largely meaningless for a Christian, but redolent of Jewish culture and tradition. Example, Tamison, Septima, Abner, Katwaleter. This surname would seem to come from the Arabic Katwalada, firstborn son. Note also the use of the given name Cyrus, the Persian king who freed the Jews from the Babylonian exile, and Judah, a Hebrew tribe, the name also for the Jewish homeland. Chapman and Carey both are on the French Huguenot list, and again we see Jewish historic names such as Lydia and Mariah. Eliezer or Eli, these are strongly Jewish Hebrew surnames. There is a very low probability of a non Jewish ancestry for someone carrying this surname. Gades or Gadis, this is the French spelling of Cadiz, Spain, a primarily Muslim and Sephardic stronghold. All right, so anybody with that name, that's their origin. Lenore. All right, or the black, right, Lenore, or the dark. This name means the dark in French, commonly used to designate Moors. Moon, a common Sephardic surname was Luna, Moon, Hebrew, Jarak. Pharaoh, this is an Arabic for king, ruler, example, Pharaoh. Rhodes, after the expulsion from Spain, a large Sephardic community settled in Rhodes. Shin. This is the Hebrew letter. Other examples include Gemel, Gimbal, Sin, Tuf, Kaf, and Bat that became surnames. Silver, surnames which alluded to Jewish and Moorish dominated trades or crafts are strong clues to these ethnicities. Examples include silver, silver, Superman, gold, golden, goldman, goldsmith, crystaller, crystal trader, Elspinstone, ivory, silk, pepper, saltman, and vermilion, a red dye. Wali, this is the French rendering of the Arabic Wali. Friend, client, a common Moorish surname. In this case, the Hebrew and Greek naming patterns suggest Sephardic, not Islamic, religious affiliation. It says here, Lutherans. In 1728, a congregation of German Lutherans accompanied their pastor, Johann Caspar Stover, to Pennsylvania. Stover was well-educated and could read Latin, Greek, Hebrew, and French in addition to his native German. 
A second table in Appendix H presents the surnames of most Stover's congregation. We believe all those listed are likely Jewish. An ancestry example of our reasoning are given below. Acker, Ackerman, this surname ref references one from Acre, an important city in Syria, Lebanon, or Acre. Aras, an Arabic surname. Bas, an Arabic surname. Bartholomew, the Italianized rendering of Bartholomew, a Hebrew surname. Ben Swanger, a prominent colonial era Jewish surname. Bubar, a version of a Hebrew surname. Example, Jewish philosopher Martin Buber. Canaan, a Hebrew surname for the land between Israel and Egypt. Cantor, singer, chanter in a Jewish service. Kants, Kuntz, Kuntz, an acronym for the Kohani, Pasadik, righteous priest. Cohen, a form of Kohen, the Jewish priestly caste. Danin, Hebrew for judge. Engel, the German form of angel, a common Sephardic surname. Fabian, Italian Jewish surname. Ferrar, ferry, common Sephardic surnames, means smith, iron worker. Fuchs, of German for fox. Gross, or Grossman, means large in German, very common Ashkenazic surname. Gur, Turkish and Arabic for foreigner, stranger. Hamon, Amon. Hebrew surname, meaning that which is hidden. Hart, Hartman Hertz, version of deer, a Hebrew tribal totem for Naphtali, Naphtali. Israel, Jacobi, Jacobs, Hebrew ancestral surnames. Cat, Hebrew letter. Cat, Tint, Kuhn, another acronym for Kohen, Tzedek. Lar, Levant, Lures, Levant, Lo, Loi versions of Levi, with a play on the German for lion. Maur, Moor, Moor, Moorhead, Moor or Islamic. Moser, 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 alternative forms of Moses. Or, Gold in Latin and French. Philippi, a form of the Greek name Philip, like Alexander, very common among medieval Jews. Saladin, Arabic for light of religion, as in the uh, famed Muslim general Saladin, Sharetz, Hebrew word, Simon or Solomon, Hebrew given in last name, Sin, Tau, Toth, Hebrew letters, Sonat, Sontag, German for Sunday, common Ashkenazic surname, Spanhauer, German for refugee from Spain, example, one who fled the Inquisition, Wolf, Hebrew tribal totem for Levi, Wolf, that's the surname in origin, Se. Hebrew letter. It says here some more. Gaius, a version of Ges, Gas, Gis, Gos, which is Turkish for holy warrior. Gans, Gans, German for goose. The surname of German Jewish metallurgist on the Roanoke expedition in 1587. All right. Gemel, a Hebrew letter. Glassic, Glasser, indicate the bearer is a glacier, a Sephardic and Moorish dominated craft. Haman or Haman. Persian Arabic surnames, as is Hari, Harry, Hay, Hayes, and Hay, the Hebrew letters standing for Hayim, life, king, and coining, Jewish surnames denoting that the bearer was in service to the monarch, as were Kron and Cronin, Crown, Laura, Laura, Lore, and Lori, versions of the Sephardic surname Luri or Luria, as exemplified by Rabbi Isaac Luria. Maurer, German for Mason. All right, we've shown that before. Remember, Maur, Maurer also was Mason in German. It didn't just mean complexion. Maurer. Morgenstern, Morningstar. Morgenstern. This is deep right here because a lot of these people came to America. They became Morningstar and they, took, they said it was an indigenous surname. Again, Morningstar, a lot of these Germans, so-called black Germans, they came. I learned this from a good brother. Shout out to Anu, letting me know this before I even read it. All right. He told me there's a, there's a people where the Morningstars, you know, they're not even, you know, Indians. A lot of them just originate. They just anglicized their name from Morgenstern, became Morningstar. 
all right there's also another family littlefoot it goes back to some german uh you know version of it they anglicized it okay so that's just a couple of examples i was thought it was interesting that it came up here which is a common ashkenazic jewish surname it says slangry spanish for blood Valentine, a common Sephardic surname, meaning that the bearer was from Valencia. Valentine, Valencia. Names such as these, all right, should cause us to rethink just who the early settlers of Pennsylvania were. If they were truly German, why were they carrying surnames such as Saladin, Solomons, and Kuntz? Henry Frank Elschleman's excellent historic background in annals of the Swiss and German pioneer settlers of southeastern Pennsylvania can provide some clues. Eschleman traces non-conformity in Christian Europe back to the 800s to 1400s time period. During these centuries, there were numerous challenges to Catholic orthodoxy, including but not mentioned by Eschleman, the resurgence of Judaism. Among the most prominent of these non-conformist Christian sects were the iconoclasts, the Paulicians, Bogomils, or Friends of God, the Waldensians, known as the Israelites of the Alps, the Katars and Albigensians and Lollards. One religious sect dating from 1340, according to Eschleman, was actually named Hagar, a Sephardic Jewish surname. The Caucasus people called Khazars. All right, we're about to get into the Khazars, right? Who's the Khazars? We already know. Let's see what they're going to tell us here. So it says the Caucasus people called Khazars converted to Judaism in the 10th century and moved eastward into the Ukraine and Poland during the 12th to 14th centuries, bringing a confusion of religions so that the term for heretic and Catholicism became the same as the German word for Khazars or Kurtz, Kurtzer. All right. They were bringing so many what? Bringing confusion of religions. Right, a confusion of religion, these Kaisers, they became literally the heretics, the German word for Kaisers, right? The 15th and 16th centuries saw the birth of the Moravians and Anabaptists, all right? Again, he didn't mention it here, but a lot of these Kaisers are today's Ashkenazi Jews. They converted. They're not even from ancient, you know, what I'm going to say. <laughs> In 1496, four years after the Inquisition began and Jews were banned from Spain, a man named Menno Simon was born in Holland. As both his given and surnames indicate Hebrew affiliation, we believe it is very likely that Menno Simon was a Sephardic descent. By 1525, he had founded the Mennonites. All right, Menno, the Mennonites. He was a Sephardic Jew. Simon, that was his last name, Simon. All right, he founded the Mennonites, a sect that plays a prominent role in German, Dutch, and Hungarian Protestantism. Who are these Protestants again? Remember, in 1901, book by Kunz, the German and Swiss settlement of colonial Pennsylvania, estimates that over 100,000 immigrants from these two countries arrived in colonial Pennsylvania, okay? Several Protestant sects were represented among them, Swiss Mennonites, the Walloons, and the Huguenots, okay? All these, a lot of these mostly Moorish people or just what you call so-called Negroes, all right? Quakerism, connotes, had been introduced to Germany by William Ames, Sephardic, in 1655, and that another Quaker, William Canton, Hebrew, Arabic word meaning small, little, had visited the German Palatinate at a later date. Another Johann Jacob Zimmerman, one of the founders of the Germantown colony in Pennsylvania, was an esteemed astrologer, magician, and Kabbalist. And still another early minister, Johann Kelpius, believed he was to be taken up into heaven, a life like Elijah. All right, all right. So I thought it would be kind of cool to go back into one of my other uh, older videos, uh, Abraham Lincoln, the so-called Negro. All right. What it was uh, key uh, in this video to what relates to today is that on his dad's side, they were Quakers. 
they were basically the same people we were just talking about these these germans immigrants that were being sent to pennsylvania what they didn't mention was that uh, most of these were very poor people people they didn't want they were trying to get rid of a lot of those were again sephardic moorish people crypto jews that needed to leave because they were being persecuted by the catholics a lot of them came in again as indentured servants including um one of the ancestors of abraham uh samuel as we shall see most likely Linkhorn, not Lincoln, Linkhorn, a German last name, Linkhorn, not Lincoln. Again, let's get this uh, real quick, like it's the first time. Make sure to catch the full video if you haven't. My video on Abraham Lincoln, great information. Just wanted to remind everybody, we're not gonna talk about it today, but we already know that a Abraham Lincoln was a so-called black man. Uh, this is an example right here of life of abraham lincoln being a biography of his life from his birth to his ass uh, assassination all right this is an actual autobiography um these are uh, notes uh, primary sources uh the video i show the book names and all this stuff numerous sources this is a quote from himself uh, abraham lincoln he says if any personal description of me is thought desirable it may be said i am in height six feet four inches nearly lean in flesh weighing on average 180 pounds dark complexion with coarse coarse black hair and gray eyes no other marks or brands recollected and again that last phrase he said there he's making a joke that's what runaway slaves they that's the advertisement you know the message the special message at the end it would say if they had any marks or tattoos or any brands on them, it would say, you know, if it didn't, it would say things like no other marks or brands recollected trying to describe them. He was a runaway. He was an indentured servant to his family. He ran away, Abraham Lincoln or Linkhorn. <laughs> All right. And he described himself here as dark complexion with coarse hair. This is his autobiography. Okay. We showed the original we showed the original in his writing in this video so make sure to catch that again we're going to just get a little quick experts from that video mentioning on his dad's side something very interesting that relates to what we're learning right now about the german uh quakers who are actually crypto moorish sephardic jews you know, a little bit of history of uh, Abraham Lincoln and his, you know, genealogy, supposedly. This is, I got it from the uh, Library of Congress. It says here, Abraham Lincoln, the president of the United States of America, an American lawyer, was born in part of Hardin County, Kentucky, which is now included in Larue County, February 12, 1809. His ancestors, who were Quakers, all right? So remember, he said he was dark complexion and that he was a slave and a servant, indentured servant. So his ancestors were Quakers from Berks County, Pennsylvania, who went to Rockingham County, Virginia. And from there, his grandfather, Abraham, removed with his family to Kentucky about 1782 and was killed by Indians in 1784. So his grandfather was killed by Indians. Thomas Lincoln, so that's his dad, Thomas Lincoln, right, who indentured him, right? The father of Abraham was born in Virginia and in 1806 married Nancy Hanks, also a Virginian. So that was his mom, Nancy Hanks, as they say. In 1816, he removed with his family to what is now Spencer County, Indiana, where Abraham, being large for his age, very large, he was very tall, they say, was put to work. He was put to work right away, right? Remember, with an ax to assist in clearing away the forest and for the next 10 years was mostly occupied in hard labor on his father's farm. All right, hard labor. They ain't saying why. He was an indentured servant for that. And it says here, Abraham Lincoln or Link Horn. All right. It says, this is an argument read by L.P. Henny, Henninghausen at the yearly meeting of the society in 1901. It says, was it a blunder of the clerk in the land office of Richmond, Virginia in 1780 when he issued the land warrant to the grandfather of Abraham Lincoln by the name of Abraham Link Horn, as alleged by his biographers? All right. So what this person is talking about is that Abraham's grandfather is referred to in, in, in documents, in all documents, as not Lincoln with the C-O-L-N, but Link Horn, as you see here. 
And they said, they wrote it off in history saying, well, that was blunders by the clerics and all these people who didn't know how to spell or whatever. And so he's going to show you something in this article, though. It says, the only historical information we have of the ancestry of Abraham Lincoln is his own saying that his ancestors originally came from Berks County, Pennsylvania. All right. And moved from there to Rockingham County, Virginia. That his grandfather, Abraham, about 1780, with his wife and children, left Rockingham County to establish himself in Jefferson County on a farm about 20 miles east of the present city of Louisville. This grandfather was a man of some means, for we find that before he left for Jefferson County, he obtained from the land office of the Commonwealth of Virginia in payment of the sum of 160 pounds current money, the land office treasury warrant number 334, bearing the date the fourth day of March 1780 and directed to the principal survey of any county within the Commonwealth of Virginia to survey and lay off in one or more surveys for Abraham Linkhorn, his heirs and assigns the quantity of 400 acres of land due to said Linkhorn. All right, so he's saying there's a document from 1780 that says he named himself Linkhorn. Here is the document that says, I hear off a facsimile of said land warrant. This shall be your warrants, survey, and lay off in more and says Abraham Linkhorn. You see his signature? Kentucky was at that time a part of Virginia, still inhabited by Indians, who resisted the white invader by every craft of cruel warfare known to them. The reports of the wonderfully fertile soil and salubrious climate of the territory brought home by adventurous hunters from the western frontier settlements of North Carolina, Virginia, and Maryland were the cause of the immigration of many from these parts of the county to Kentucky. So your ancestors here, you know, making sure they're fighting, they're trying to keep their land. Western Maryland, West Virginia, and Western North Carolina are reported to be the first and principally settled by Germans from Berks, Lancaster, Bucks, and other counties of Pennsylvania. So now, listen to this. So, remember, he's saying that their family came from that place in Virginia who had actually been there from Pennsylvania, right, in the Berks. And these were Germans, all right, Germans, Lincoln. hmm. Abraham Lincoln must have taken his time to select his future homestead, for it was five years later, on May 7th, 1785, that he received his certificate of the survey of 400 acres of land in Jefferson County by virtue of said treasury warrant number 334 on the Fork of Floyd's Fork. All right, so blah, blah, blah. And so here's the written letter. So as you will see from this that the name Abraham Lincoln appears in the body of the warrant. And it is also signed by him, Linkhorn. While his two officials who had to affix their signatures to the warrant named Analia Lincoln and Joshua Lincoln signed as such and not as Linkhorn. In the next year, 1786, this Abraham Linkhorn was killed by the Indians. His son, Thomas, all right, this is Abraham Lincoln's dad, Thomas, the father of President Lincoln, was then only seven years of age. He was allowed to grow up without any schooling. He was allowed to grow up with no schooling. Remember, he was an escaped runaway indentured servant to his dad. So he grew up without schooling. That's well, that would make sense if he's an indentured servant. He never learned to write. And we are not informed whether he could read. He was known as Lincoln. He was known as Lincoln. So maybe his dad says he didn't know how to write or read. He was writing it wrong. So during the lifetime of President Lincoln, no one ever appeared to claim or was recognized by him as a relative on his father's side of his ancestors. All right, so we're going to get into how mysterious and they don't really know. It's hard for them to really trace his genealogy. It's like a mystery. So it is only since the death of the, the great man that the attempt is made to connect him with a certain Mar Mordecai Lincoln, gentleman of Massachusetts, who removed to Mo Monmouth, New Jersey. So you see, they try to link him to a wealthy noble guy, right? Where he is said to have died in 1735. Whenever President Lincoln was asked about the genealogy of his family, he loved to quote the line from Grace Elegy on a Country Churchyard. You must look into the short and simple annals of the poor. So he himself is saying he is poor. Continuing on here, it says, The labors efforts of the biographers of the president to make him a descendant of a rich gentleman from New England who died only 73 years before Lincoln was born and the observed assertion that the name and signature of his grandfather was by an ignorant or mischievous clerk changed from the well-known historic English Lincoln to the German-sounding Linkhorn, especially when two attestant officials named Lincoln also affixed their signatures 
belongs to nursery tales and not to historical research. So he's saying that in the same letter, in this same letter, there's a he signed Linkhorn, and there's actually people who signed Lincoln the correct way. So why would he's why would the clerk sign it wrong? Right? They know what they're spelling is what he's saying. The fact that the warrant and certificate are the only new monuments of title to the 400 acre homestead of Abraham Linkhorn is conclusive. And this is the only existing title of his grandfather. And they're saying it's a mistake without the clearest proof to the contrary that Linkhorn and not the more familiar and common Lincoln, the name of an old English city and county was the family name of the grandfather of the president and was changed like an untold number of German names by by enduring the life of his illiterate son thomas says lincoln said his ancestors came from berks county pennsylvania and emigrated from there to rockingham county virginia now listen to this as we know that the berks county was settled by germans at the end of the 17th and first decades of the 18th century and the german language is to this day the common vernacular of the people of the county further we know that in the third decade of the 18th century, an emigration set out from Berks in adjoining counties to Rockingham County, Virginia, and that many of these German immigrants were German Quakers or non-combatants, Mennonites. All right, we're going to get into all these people in the future under my next video, dealing with indentured servitude. Mennonites, all these people are Quakers, Protestants, basically a type of Protestant the Quakers were. All right, and these were mostly indentured servants. I'm going to show you this. I've mentioned it before. I know you remember in my past video, but these are all indentured servants arriving in Pennsylvania and emigrating to Virginia. This is documented. This is historical migrations, U.S. American historical migrations of these people. Lincoln stated his ancestors were Quakers from the church records and schoolhouses erected by these new settlers in Virginia, as well as from many family Bibles, hymns, books, certificates, letters, etc., Still preserved, we know that they were not illiterate, and if Abraham Linkhorn was one of them, he could write his name, and neither the land office in Richmond nor the surveyors in their certificate are guilty of clerical errors. So real quick, just to correlate, so let's see, exploring diversity in Pennsylvania history. The German settlement in Pennsylvania, this is from the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, with the Balch Institute for Ethnic Studies. It says, in 1683, a group of Quakers and Mennonites from the Krefeld region of the Rhineland founded the city of Germantown, the first recorded German settlement in the English colonies. Mennonites were religious dissenters who believed in adult baptism and absolute pacifism. William Penn had proselytized among Rhine Valley dissenters and invited them to settle in his colony. Right, we know historically William Penn did do that, and he did it through the indenture system, headright system. That's how he did it. We got this already. By 1710, German immigration to Pennsylvania increased significantly. German immigrants founded Skipack in 1702 in Ole and Contestoga in 1709. Most early German immigrants came from the southwest region of Germany, the area known as the Rhineland, Palatinate, Württemberg, Baden, and German Switzerland. Study those regions. Do you find Moors in those regions? I bet you will in, in, in history. Between 1727 and 1775, approximately 65,000 Germans landed in Philadelphia and settled in the region while some German immigrants landed in other ports and moved to Pennsylvania. The largest wave of German immigration to Pennsylvania occurred during the years 1749-1754, but ta tapered off during the French and Indian Wars and after the American Revolution. The wars in the colonies in Europe combined with the rise in land prices made it difficult to attract German immigrants, especially those with families. There were many reasons why Germans left their homeland to make the treacherous journey across the Atlantic to America. Although much has been said but about religious persecution, the centers compromised a minority of German immigrants to Pennsylvania. You hear that? That was the minority. The centers were not the majority. You see, this is very important. I want you to pay attention to what I'm about to say. So during our in history when they was teaching us about these immigrants they never wanted to teach us that they were indentured servants or like slaves that they went through a middle passage or and were treated like chattel property so they would use this whole religious dissenters religious persecutions and all this they were re seeking religious freedom made them look like victims and, and and that they were actually on their own coming over here and 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 you know happily but in reality as is letting us know here dissenters or these kind of people who were religiously persecuted were a minority 
that were immigrants from Saint. And most were affiliated with Lutheran Reformed churches, conservative religious groups. They left primarily because of the devastation of the Thirty Year War and the subsequent wars between the German principalities and France. For these immigrants, the colony of Pennsylvania must have seemed like a land of opportunity, despite accounts written by travelers such as Goldlieb Middleberger, who warned his fellow countrymen of the dangers they would encounter. We got a book of him already. Instead, most chose to believe letters from relatives such as Christopher Sarr, who wrote of the generous land grants and political and religious freedom in the colony of Pennsylvania. It says German immigrants tended to come in family units and were often tradesmen or artisans. One historian described a typical German immigrant as a poor farmer or artisan who arrived around 1750 with a wife and two children. They were most likely in debt for passage across the Atlantic, but had family or friends already settled in America. They were affiliated with the Lutheran or Reformed Church, but only loosely committed to an organized religion. Records indicate records indicate that they became prosperous members of the community. However, many were too poor to pay for that. What? For the transatlantic passage. We're talking about the German transatlantic slave trade. Yes, not the African slave trade, transatlantic. We're talking about the German transatlantic slave trade. So as many as one half of two thirds of German immigrants came to Pennsylvania as what? Indentured servants. Again, the German transatlantic slave trade. Indentured servants or redemptioners, as Germans called them. Immigrants would pay back the ship owner for their passage and expenses by contracting their services to an employer for a set number of years, usually between two to seven years when their term of service was completed. Their indebtedness was redeemed. Conditions varied for indentured servants and families could be separated for years. By the time of the Revolutionary War, there were approximately 65,000 to 75,000 ethnically German residents in Pennsylvania. We're talking about, you see that? Now were all these people white Germans? That's the hijack you got to dodge. We can't go and generalize. We got to go case by case individual. A lot of these were so-called black German, swarthy, swarts, swarthy German. So we see that. All right, so we're back in the book, Jews and Muslims in British Colonial America. All right, so we continue where we left off. So again, let us look beyond the appearances now of these German settlers who became Quakers, right? Who were a lot of them, again, carrying Moorish and Sephardic surnames. Chief Dull compiled a list of the early German settlers of George County, Pennsylvania. All right, again, George County. It is given in Appendix H among the names already discussed. Example, Acker. We find some new entries suggestive of the Jewish or Islamic ancestry. Amma and Amman are both Arabic, as are Bar and Bentzel. Bless is likely the anglicized form of Baruch, blessing. Bone and boner are forms of the Spanish and French words for good or bone, right? Bo bueno, a common Sephardic surname. Bu Buat is Arabic Turkish. Capel is Ashkenazic, example, as in television reporter Ted Copel. We find also several French Huguenot names, example, De Bus, De Graf, among the German entries. Deus, Dot, Dudel are various forms of David, all right? Again, the Dos row, that's David, <laughs> the David row. Dunkel means dark, all right? Dunkel means what? Dark, and is the German equivalent for Moreno, example, dark skinned. El Sacer is Hebrew Arabic meaning from Alsace or Alsace Lorraine. Isaac is a form of Isaac. Fiesel is Arabic, example Faisal. Florentina denotes one from Florence, Italy, which had a large post expulsion population of Jews and Moors. All right, and Moors, where again Florence, Italy, Moors, Blum, Flower is an Ashkenazic surname. Folks and Fuchs are the German equivalents of Fox, commonly Ashkenazic, alluding to Phoebus, Phoebus, Frank, France, and French describe the bearer as being from France or Frankish lands in the Levant. The Franks family was one of the most prominent colonial Jewish families in Pennsylvania. The Franks surname belonged 
to one of the first families of American Jewry. It shows a similar trajectory to many other Portuguese Jewish family exiles, all right? The Portuguese, remember, Jews were very dark complexion described in most primary sources from their time, in colonial times especially, exiled in German or Dutch lands, all right? These Portuguese were where? Exiled in German or Dutch lands, mercantile activities with London as one of their seats, a branch sent to the colonies to be naturalized under the new citizenship rules of Queen Anne, prosperity as merchants and partial return to England, where they intermarried with nobility. After their expulsion, these Moorish Sephardic people, you know, they're marrying nobility, they're becoming merchants. According to historian Charles Henry Hart, it seems to be conceded that the American emigrant of the family was Jacob Franks, who came to this country according to one account circa 1705 and according to another in 1711. His father is variously stated to have been Aaron Franks and Naftali Franks of Germany, the former of whom is claimed went to England with George of Hanover in 1714 to be crowned King of Great Britain. Wow. Jacob Franks was born in 1688 and died in New York. January 16, 1769. In 1719, he married Bella Abigail Levi, daughter of Moses Levi, or Levi, and had children David, Phila, and Moses. David Franks, uh, born in New York, September 28, 1720, removed to Philadelphia circa 1738 and married there December 17, 1743. All right, now continuing with the book, it says that 1767 tax list for Berkshire County, Pennsylvania, is also enlightening as to the settlers' likely ethnicities. It begins with a Michael Algier. Example, Algiers, the North African city inhabited by Moors and Sephards. All right, we find here also the Hebrew Arabic Haga. There is an Isaac Levon resident in the county and all county and also an Adam Shamel, example Ishmael. Oseas will likely be the Turkish Osias, and Rhodes would be Rhodes. Safed is from Safed, the Middle Eastern city. Mr. G. Hal carries a Hebrew Arabic name. Hans Moser's surname is a rendering of Moshe, and we have Daniel Zacharias and Lloyd Abel or Abel, two more Hebrew favorites. There's also Henry Aker, Syrian city, John Turk or Turk, and Nicholas Saladin, the Muslim conqueror of the Holy Land in 1210. Henry Hava has a surname that means life in Hebrew. The Romic Romic surnames designates one from Rome. Jakam is the common Sephardic surname for Joachim. In first families of Chester County, Pennsylvania, we find community leaders, Sebulon, and Israel hoops, example, Chupa, the Judaic marriage canopy. There's also Anne Ash, and Abraham, and Esther Ashton, and Allen family, and Chester has the following consistently Hebrew named children, Dina, Ellis, Emmy, Amor, Epra, Esther, Isaac, Lavinia, Moro, Orpha, Reuben, and Tamer, Similarly, a Baldwin, Bowden, all right, Baldwin, Bowden family in Chester named their children Caleb, Deborah, Isaac, Israel, Levina, Lydia, Rachel, and Ruth. Traditional historians have proposed that these are simply Old Testament names used by ardent Christians. But such explanations fail to account for the presence of Greek names, example Lydia, which are non-biblical, and names such as Tamar, which are simply Hebrew, Arabic. We also find in Chester, Pennsylvania, a settler named Francis Bethel, Hebrew for House of God, Sylvanus Day, whose surname was perhaps anglicized from the Spanish Diaz. All right, Day Diaz. There are also Rebecca Ecus and John Fadis who bear Arabic surnames. John Gracie's surname was likely recast from the Spanish Gracia. Gracie, right? Gracia. Gracie says Gracia. The Hebert family in Chester has members named Aaron, Abraham, Caleb, Deborah, Enos, Easter, Hezekiah, Israel, Jacob, Joel, Joshua, Naomi, 
Orpha, Phoenix, Silas, and Rhoda. Hebrew, Perose, not found in the Bible. Further down the list of Chester residents, we find Michael Israel, Isaac Jacobs, Archibald Job, Janny Abel, Judea Kane, Henrietta Levis, and Hannah Leah. These persons are very unlikely to be Christian. All right, again, doing genealogy. This is a common thing. We start getting into these colonial times, start seeing these big families and all of them naming all their kids, marrying people who have, all have Hebrew names, like the 12 tribes, you know, the patriarchs, the prophets, everything. All right. The Maris, the Maris means sea, ocean. Family has members named Aaron, Barkley, Caleb, Elis, Esther, Jehu, Jemima, Judith, Lydia, Mordecai, Norris, Phoebe, Ruth, and Tacy. The presence of Greek names Phoebe and Lydia, together with Arabic names Norris, Light, make it very unlikely again that the family is Christian. The Marshall family exhibits the same pattern. Abner, Abraham, Armit, Benjamin, Eli, Israel, Levi, Mabel, Massey, Mira, Moses, Pinock, and Savory. Additional Chester, Pennsylvania residents include Barak, Missioner, Levi's, Pennock, Hannah, Rhodes, Abraham Roman, Isaac, Isaac Schofield, Esther, Rachel, and Sarah Temple, Sarah, Titus, Abraham Widows, and Elhanan Suk or Shuk. It is difficult to construe these as Christian names. We close our discussion of Chester with the Sharpless, Sharpless family, whose members carry the names Aaron, Abby, Abraham, Abner, Bula, Caleb, Casper, Danny, Dinia, Eli, Enos, Jonathan, Lydia, Myra, Naomi, Reuben, and Ruth. Such a pattern would not be appropriate for a Christian family, but would be very meaningful for a Sephardic family aware of its Mediterranean heritage. Some additional likely Sephardic Moorish settlers in Pennsylvania, Moorish, are found in book Immigrants to Pennsylvania. These include Anna Habaki, Emmanuel Hyams, Isaac Moss, Henry Sharrick, John Sin, Tin, Israel Morris, William Athens, Joaquim Luke, Fortuna, Toff, Joran Dufua, Tuckerlson, Timmerman, Anders Geta, a city in Saudi Arabia, John Tysak, L. Anada, Philip Mayo, T. Alferi or Alfari, Diamond, a trade always monopolized by Jews, Bensian, Ben Sion, Lawrence Baggy, or Turkish for ruler, King, John Arbel, Salome Steinman, Jacob Bechtel, Abigail Pedro, Ebenezer Sanis, Daniel Jappi, Philippe Heim, Scheim, David Tischel, Alexander Florentine, or Florentine, Moses Heyman, Hyman, Isaac Price, Maurice Nihil, Pyramus Green, Balser Els Legal, Samuel Hazel, William Fagan, Joseph Saul, Patrick O'Hazen, Berber, Anthony Sidon, Michael Girael, William Gaman, Susanna Fassel, Judeo Arabic, William Geddes, Cadiz, Gadis, Barak, Wright, Annie Kanadi, Tobias Nile, James Abraham, Matthew Gamalice, Roland, Jude, James Benset, Mary Hyman, Hyman, Wendell Sarban, Jacob Diamond, Mary Schickel, Shekel, Hebrew Money, Stephen Carmack, Anna Dingase, Solomon Albright, Patrick Taffy, David Solomon, Thomas Dara, Casper Singer, Cantor, Levi Marks, and Frederick Castile, or Castile. All right, so continuing the book, Jews and Muslims in British Colonial America, all right? It says here, Swedish naturalization. Another rich source for the Sephardic immigrants to Pennsylvania were the Swedes, okay? A lot of your uh, genealogies might go back to these people, especially when you're going back to uh, Maryland and Pennsylvania. And again, a lot of these Swedes are what? Sephardic immigrants. Remember that if you get to anybody in your line that happens to be a Swede from Pennsylvania or Maryland, any of those areas in the colonies, many of whom were already in place from the former colony of New Sweden. All right. When the Philadelphia County Court held its first session on January 11th, 
1683, 17 Swedish settlers came forward and asked for the rights and privileges of citizenship. The act of naturalization passed by the assembly in December 1682 gave landowning foreigners residing in Pennsylvania or the lower counties three months to be naturalized. The Swedes swore allegiance to the King of England in obedience to Penn as governor and paid a fee of 20 shillings sterling. By doing so, they received the same rights as their English-born neighbors. They were Lassie Cock, Peter Rambo, Swan Swanson, Andrew Swanson, Wally Swanson, Lassie Anderson, Mounds Cock, Eric Cock, Gunner Rambo, Peter Nilsson Lakin, Christian Thomas, Eric Mullica, Peter Cock Jr., John Boyles, Andrew Salem, John Stahl, and Lassie Dalbo. Several of these Swedish settlers appeared to be of Sephardic and Moorish ancestry, as indicated by their names. Rambo or Rambooks is a French Sephardic surname. Mulica is Spanish, Dalbo is French, and Salem is Arabic. We already noted how the venture, ven venture that briefly flourished as New Sweden was organized by the same Sephardic merchants as New Amsterdam. So it is not surprising to see familiar types in this list. Again, we got that in the last uh, installment of this series, reading this book, the last chapter, chapter five. Additionally, from the Bucks County Church Records, volume three, one should note early settlers, Elizabeth Hebron or Hebron City in Palestine and Gomery and Penquit Chapman, the Quaker commercial atmosphere of Pennsylvania attracted a number of Jewish Indian traders to its hinterlands. A snapshot into the names of traders can be gleaned from documents in the Pennsylvania archives covering the years 1743 to 1775. This ignores, of course, all the unregistered peddlers and fly-by night merchants. Some of the more overt Jewish names are Christopher Jacob, Benjamin Spiker, Specker, Swine, George Crohan, Cron or Crown, Lazarus Lowry, Luria, James Lowry, Simon, Jerdy, John Hart, Samuel Cross, Jacob Cressman, Nicholas Swamp or Soto, Bartolomeu Toole, Toulet, Jacob Klein, Abraham Moses, Francis Hare, Elias Bender, German, Hoop Worker, George Ray, Jacob Barr, Isaac Wolf, Joseph Solomon Cohen, Michael Hart, David Schillerman, or Schullerman, Abraham Levi, Jacob Isaiah Cohen, Michael Hay, John Barron, Joseph Solomon, Isaiah Cohen, Ephraim Abraham, Abraham Levi, John McCohen, and Lion Nathan. All right, continuing, it says here, case history, Wampler family. The Wampler family from Spartsbach, Alsace, represents one of the author's ancestral lines, Elizabeth Hirschman's. They pose an archetypical instance of crypto-Jewish Pennsylvania Dutch Dutch phenomenon discussed in this chapter and so can constitute a good case study. Hans Peter Wampler was born 1701 in Sparsback and died in 1749 in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. He was a linen weaver by trade. The Wampler family seems to have appeared in the 1500s and Switzerland, all right? They just appear out of nowhere, these Wamplers, and to have taken their surname from a tiny village there called Wampflin. The earliest church records for them date from 1559. In the year 1561, two male children, Hans and Anthony Wampler, were christened. The witnesses were Jacob Flogery, Nicholas Tucher, old Laddie Kammer, and Nicholas Jutzelitzer. Wife. At a later christening for a child named Jacob, witnesses include Ul Hela, Haney Witter, Christian Worthy, and Margaret Ashler. Later witnesses to other christenings included an Ottomar, Ottomar Turkish Stali, an eligible Sapali Margaret Kunz, Peter Moorer, Jacob Augustine, Eva Sapati, Jacob Stuckey, Peter Perry, Jacob Egler, Bat Elliman or German, and Barbara Wolf. As should now be expected, we are going to argue that the Wampler family was crypto Jewish while living in Switzerland. What are the clues? First, the family has taken on local place surnames, which was common for incoming Jews, but not usual for long term residents or immigrating non Jews. 
Second, wamplers do not appear in the records prior to 1559, suggesting immigration to that locality at a time coinciding with the spread of the Inquisition to France and Holland. Third, their children are given Mediterranean and Hebrew names, example, Anthony and Jacob. Fourth, the witnesses to the Christians, Christians were required to establish legitimacy, bore several Jewish surnames, example, Tusher, Tamar, Hala, Ashler, Kunz, Murer, Sapati, Achman, Wolf, and Piri. Fifth, the family apparently was skilled in linen, weaving, and trade, strongly associated with Huguenots, and thus Sephards and Moors. They were Moors, all right? The authors, this is the author, I believe this is a white lady, or so called white, excuse me, pale skinned person, right? Light skinned person today would be considered a, a white person, but she descends from what? Sephards and Moors. Six, the family had migrated by the 1700s to Alsace, the location of large open crypto Jewish communities. Alsace was the place where they lived before going to America. The Wamper family immigrated to Philadelphia in 1741 aboard the Lydia with several other persons coming from the Palatinate. All right, I find this a lot in a lot of people's genealogy coming from the Palatinate region. We have the uh, ship manifest and everything the immigration documents and records and literally saying Huguenot refugees literally Hans Peter Wampler the author's ancestor settled in Lancaster County attending the Lutheran Church near Klinoa Pennsylvania his son Hans Peter born 1723 married Barbara Bernice in 1743 and had children named Jacob David, John, Daniel, Joseph, Barbara, Eve, Christina, Philip, Tina, and Anne. The family then made its way to Frederick County, Maryland. Of the children who married David, wed a woman surnamed Suseni, Sephardic surname. John married a Garber. Christina married a Gabriel, Sephardic surname. Phyllis, Tina married Philip Engels, Sephardic surname. And Anne married a Hartman, Ashkenazic surname. Several of these family members then migrated to Wheatley County, Virginia, a Melungeon community. All right. So a lot of these people mixed with the Indians, a lot of them became known as Melungeons. All right. Michael Wampler together with Martin Kimberlin, Michael Steffi, another ancestor of the author, and John Filippi recalled that this Greek name was widely used by Jews, were, were the elders who founded St. Paul's Lutheran Church in rural retreat, Virginia. St. Paul's was later renamed Sion Church. Elizabeth Wampler, daughter of Michael, born about 1752, married Ludwig Abel, Jewish surname, and George Davis, Jewish surname, in Wythe County, having children David, Jonathan, and Maria Salmi. Later generations in Wythe County married persons surnamed Copenhagen, example Copenhagen, Denmark, a refuge for Sephardic Jews. Catherine, Sarah, C. Mary Magdalena, Wolf, Mary Magdalena Koenig or King, and Jacob Kinzer. Subsequent marriages were made with the Steffi family, the Jacob King family, and the Kinsler family. Children's names began to include Israel, Esther, and Leah. We see this same pattern repeated for some Wampler lines that remained in Pennsylvania. Roy H. Wampler's book, A Wampler Family History, documents a much larger set of ancestors and descendants we learned that peter wampler born about 1649 married magdalena kunz kohani tesedek and that anna magdalena wampler had married samuel metower linen weaver in 1714 upon arriving in pennsylvania and moving in 1770 to virginia as wampler also documents the family practiced a distinct pattern of cousin to cousin marriage for example, in 1797, Joseph Wampler married his first cousin Esther Kinzer or Kinsey, and his brother Henry Wampler married Esther's sister Maria Kinzer. It was a common practice among Sephardims and Moriscos. All right, this was common among who? Sephardic Jews and Moors. Moriscos, their older sister Catherine Wampler, earlier married her first cousin George Kinzer. John Samuel Wampler married his second cousin, Mary Catherine Andy, Sephardic surname. Mary Susan Wampler married her second cousin, Joseph Benjamin Wampler and Virginia Viola Wampler married her second cousin, Samuel Homer Driver. Estelle Wampler married her first cousin, Charles Kuhn or Kohani 
Alice Victoria Wampler married her first cousin, John McTeer Wampler. Leftwich Porter Wampler married his first cousin, Tabitha Easter Fielder. Multiple marriages were made into the Copenhagen Eder or Eater, King Koenig Fielder and Driver families, all carrying Ashkenazic surnames, as well as the Sumbrum, Rudisil, Rudisil, Kron, Sepp, Lippi, Klein, Klein, you know, Klein, Snyder, and Hershey, Hirsch, CV, or Sivai families, all also having Ashkenazic surnames. So the Ashkenazis were making sure they were really doing it. But the smoking gun is perhaps the marriage of Johann Leonard Wampler to Anne Mary Martin, the daughter of Matthias Martin and Anna Barbara Trosho Martin. The Troshos were openly Jewish. And with the Wampler's Troshos first surface in post diaspora of Switzerland, the first name known to us is Stephen Trashel, born in 1536. According to legend, the Trashel family came to Switzerland over Vienna from Turkey, then the Ottoman Empire. Descendant Rina Bonny Burns says that there were several Jewish communities in the southern part of Emmental, Switzerland, in Canton Bern from 1385 when her daughters or daughters moved to Stevesburg. They came into contact with the Trashels or Trashelwai, who had migrated from Turkey to Greece to Austria, then Switzerland. Before that, they must have been in Spain. Other Swiss Jewish surnames, all interconnected, are Suk or Sauk or Suk, Kaufman, Amon, founder of Amish religion, founder of the Amish, okay? These are Jewish surnames, right? The Amon, the founder of Amish religion, he was Jewish, Sephardic Jew, and Shrug or Shrag, Trishel, Trishel, was not the family's original name. Like other Jews, they obviously adopted it from their place of refuge. The village name is first attested in 1131, when Ufo von Treschelwald was one of the local gentry. Strangely, the village's coat of arms shows a Star of David. The name in German means Turner's Wood, from Dreschler, a Swiss dialect from Drexel, Drexler, Dreschler. Could it be that the Treschels or Treschels, whatever their origin name, found a haven with a known Swiss Jewish community? This supposition would explain why the town arms bear a Jewish emblem. Fast forward two centuries, and we find the Trochels now calling themselves Troschel, living in Pennsylvania. David Troschel and his wife, Anna Elizabeth Sanger, Cantor, have two sons, Christian and George, George Jacob, who form marriages with Native American women. All right, what do they do, these Sephardic Moorish people? They formed marriages with who? Native or American indigenous women. The time-honored way of securing trade, all right? This is something common. It was the time-honored way. Again, I'm trying to explain to you guys. Don't just look at the indigenous or all just one line or one grandma, because maybe that grandma that you found as an Indian, maybe she's marrying not a white Christian Englishman, but a Sephardic Moorish so-called black man, all right, from Europe which has a long history and a deep history that you might be interested in. So this was a time-honored way, again, of securing trade agreements with chiefs marrying into the family, okay? The Moorish people, Sephardic Jews, did this a lot. Christian married a Shawnee woman in the band of renegade French trader Martin Chartier and George Jacob, known as Big Jake, married Corn Blossom, daughter of Cherokee war chief Doublehead, who was himself part Jewish through a trader's marriage. All right, so this chief, even this Cherokee chief, was mixed with Sephardic Jewish. Trochel was one of George Washington's spies among the Indians. A sister, Elizabeth Trochel, married Benjamin Burke, one of a minion. Quorum of ten or more Jewish adults needed to start a congregation in the Booney settlement in Kentucky. The groups included men by the names of Cooper, Bell, Gregory, Dolan, and Blevins. That is Ab, son of Levin, coincidentally spelling the word for wolf in Welsh. Jonathan and Elizabeth Troschel, sons Benjamin, married Nancy Cooper, daughter of Isaac Cooper, and Cherokee chief Black Fox daughter Nancy black fox both authors have these people as ancestors or relatives all right both these white people trace their genealogy all right the authors of this book 
to these people who turn out to be many of them Sephardic Moorish people and and indigenous people okay cousins marriage is so combulated that it would be a tour de force to show all the interconnections on its chart another marker of crypto Judaism is membership in churches that are ostensibly Christian but in fact operate as Jewish houses of worship all right again they're cryptos they're secretly practicing their other their true religions the Wampers and their related families belong to St. David's Church in West Mahim Township George County Pennsylvania and were buried in St. Jacob's Cemetery in Broadbeck's Quickle Cemetery Conewago Emmanuel Cemetery Manchester Maryland St. Elias Cemetery, Emmicksburg, Maryland, Main Tabor Cemetery, Rocker Ridge, Maryland, and Zion Cemetery in Wythe County, Virginia. Primary sources. All right, so real quick, just want to show that Jacob Troschel, he got a star of David right in his tomb. And again, he's not even supposed to be Jewish, all right? He's not even supposed to be that. But again, when he died, they made sure that they put it on, okay? To honor and remember his heritage. Again, some more tombs here, as you can see, the Coopers, all right, we know that goes back to Spain. Primary surnames associated with the Wamper family in America include the following, Albright, Angel, Brown, Burr, Cooley, Kuhn, Cohen, Copenhaver, Kramer, Krumer, Kromer, Kramer, Dehov, Dehovi, Derdol, Driver, Ickert, Epley, Fanningstock, Herald, Fieser, Fielder, Flame, Fleischmann, Busher, Flory, Flory, Fox, Fuchs, Freed, Fried, Freimier, Firmer, Fundenberg, Garber, Tanner, a Jewish trade, Garrett, Glick, Luck, Hebrew, Tough, Goods, Grable, Hagerman, Hancock, Harbrum, Hebron, Hittishu, Hoover, Horner, Hull, Humbert, Jacobs, Jacoby, Kelly, Kelly, Kemper, King, Koenig, Kinser, Kinsey, Coons, Hebrew anagram, KZ, Coons, Kuntz, or Coons. All right, what does Coon mean really? Coons, look at that. Lofman, Lippy, Little, Markle, May, Miller, Myers, Ausler, Bear, Ruhlman, Scholl, Hebrew for Scholl, Sell, Smith, Snyder, Taylor, Sterner, one who wears a Jewish star, Stoner for Steiner, Stones for Stroop, Switzer from Switzerland, Slope, Trish, Oots, Williams, Wolf, Jinglin, Sepp, compare Zeppelin, Zeppler, Polish, Warm, and Sumbrum. Enough has been said that we can draw some conclusions, all right? Although Pennsylvania was the brainchild of the English Quaker William Penn, it was not so much Englishman, all right? It wasn't really English, okay? Even recently naturalized English who flocked to the new colony but Germans and other nationalities from the continent. Penn advertised heavily across Europe. The bulk of those attracted to his international asylum for mankind were second, third, or fourth generation Sephardic Jews. Taken together, the Mennonites, the Dunkards, and other denominations, many of them more convenient covers, probably always outnumbered the Quakers, Certainly, this was true by the time of the great influx of Scots, Irish, Presbyterians after the defeat of the Jacobites at Culloden in 1746. It has been estimated 70% of all British immigrants over the past half century were Scots or Irish. The people of Pennsylvania took on a life of its own. The ethnicity of the colony became more mixed than any other, but one of the strongest common denominators was the underlying crypto Jewish roots of the settlers. Again, crypto, Sephardic Moorish people, people of color, the underlying denominators, the strongest common denominator was an underlying crypto Jewish roots of the settlers, which fostered and live and let live mindset, the desire of William Penn to populate the colony with the sons of David and the tribe of Judah was in large part brought to fruition and that's deep right there something to think about so this was uh chapter six uh pennsylvania quakers and other friends and again this was the book jews and muslims in british colonial america now want to also go into an excerpt from 
as a little bonus here uh, into my some of the um, scenes from my video I did on the Acadians, right? Now remember before we get into it, because we're going to go right into specific parts where it's talking about Quakers and the Acadians and their relation, what happened with them. Now remember, the Acadians, I'm going to show a little bit about that. They're going to describe them as Huguenots and stuff. But remember, they're Huguenots. Most of them were Huguenot ancestry, the Acadians of Canada. And they were being expelled out of there and sent to work and being treated really bad. We're going to read that right now, right? Just a refresher. And I remember who was helping these so-called Acadians. It was actually Quakers. And who were the Quakers again? Huguenots, Sephardic Jews, Moors, just like the Acadians. So let's get that like it's the first time. The Huguenots and New Friends in Acadia. Who? The Moors, right? Key word of the day. Ding, 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 ding. Huguenot Moors. The Moors and New Friends in Acadia. Let's fix that. Let's correct that. Let's stop with the tags. Then what is the Moor? That's a whole different subject. Let's go. It is little known fact that the Huguenots were also present in French colonies. The first attempt at colonizing Acadia was in 1603 by the Pontgrave and Sir Desmonts, both Huguenots, both what? Moors, Moorish people, yes. Later joined by Champlain, another Moor. Their attempt failed due to poor organization. They tried again around 1605, bringing about 20 men, soldiers and artisans, both Catholics and Protestants, but little came of it. Mr. de Rassili was the one who finally established a permanent settlement at Port Royal in 1636. The first families landed in Acadia, having traveled aboard St. Jehan, the Acadian equivalent of the Mayflower. That was their Mayflower. These adventurers needed the permission and protection of the king, as well as financing from French merchants. Who's these merchants? These are Sephardic Jews and the Muslim Moors with the money. They were the ones loaning the money and financing and everything. They made a lot of money off out of it. Yeah, they were the money handlers, yep. Remember the poor Jews, remember? The network, the Protestant, the poor Jews. Yeah, the Dutch trade. It's all the same people. Huguenot merchants were well represented in that group, all right? Especially Huguenot merchants. The home ports of these merchants were St. Malo and Rowan, with an addition to La Rochelle later. And just a little diagram. So heading over to France, going back to Nova Scotia, from France to South America, most might even uh, South Africa. Yep, they were getting sent to South Africa and South America, the Caribbean, back to the colonies, and Louisiana, right? Acadia up here, Acadia, Louisiana. All right, what is this? Looks like a triangle to me. Now, this looks like a triangle to me. Doesn't it to you? All right. The great and noble scheme, the tragic story of the expulsion of the French Acadians from their American homeland by John Mac Farragher. Men, women, and children alike were crowded into transport vessels and deported in small groups to the British colonies across continent of North America, all right? Put on ships, swarthy Acadians, swarthy French, Many families were separated, wives from husbands, daughters from mothers, some never to meet again. 10,000 or more fled into the forest and spent years living as homeless refugees. The forest, who were they living with, huh? Thousands of them were captured and deported to France. Says the myth and the beginnings of French colonization, colonialism, colonialism in the Americas of the savage, the myth of the savages. And the beginning of French colonialism in the Americas. That's the book. While the policy of creating one race was doomed to failure in New France. As elsewhere, Amerindians and French were still distinct entities at the end of French Regiment in 1760. Still, there was enough intermixing for a writer in South Carolina newspaper in 1742 to refer to the French as Swarty Brethren of Amerindians. The French were what Swarty? They were black. The French were black brethren of Amerindians. Listen to this. Now, we know they just described the Indians as Swarty, right? So Swarty Indians and Swarty French people, right? So if they come together, what do you think is going to happen? 
listen to what happens. Shortly afterward, in 1753, Abbey Maillard noted that intermixing had already proceeded so for that in his opinion, in 50 years, it would be impossible to distinguish Amerindian from French in Acadia. It's impossible. Why? How could it be impossible when well, we understand and overstand now? Why? Because they're both Swarti. They're both Swarti. They may look the same. They might have similar features. They might be anciently related. Hmm. But either way, how can you... How can you misplace an Indian from an Acadian, right? If, if Acadians are white, right, and they dress a specific way, and Indians are a specific way and look a specific way as how they told us, how can they... All right, so they tell us that they look more Mongolish, right, Indians? So how could a Mongolish Indian look like a white European? How can you mistake that? How can you not distinguish that? You get what they're saying you hear, right? Swartiness all over the place. You can't distinguish who's who. And how often did this happen in history, in American history? And we only remember in the Indian part because we always assume the European was white by the marches of Minas by Charles G.D. Roberts out of the forest in the forest. All right. It says here, Gaspar of the Black Lemarchands. The Lemarchand men were dark. Listen to this. The Lemarchand men were dark. Even for Acadians. Yo, even for Acadians. Even though they're Acadians. Yo, yo, nah. These dudes are dark, man. Like, yo. You see what they're saying, right? Listen to the words. Even for Acadians, they were dark. That means Acadians were dark skinned. They were known to be dark skinned and very dark skinned. But this particular uh, group of men or family, the Lemarchands were very, very dark complexion, even for Acadians, all right? Even for Acadians. Unlike their fellows, they were of Basque rather than Normandy or Picardy blood, swarthy of skin, black-haired, black-bearded, and with heavy, coal black eyebrows meeting over the nose, all right? Remember I told you, so we got Acadians who are Norman ancestry and Acadians who come from Basque ancestry, both a swarthy people. The Basque were very, very so-called black, very dark. They're described many times as very dark, the Basque, the Basque people, original Basque. Chronicles of Canada, edited by George M. Wrong and H. H. Langton in 32 volumes. The Acadian Exiles by Arthur G. Doughty. The Acadians had arrived at Philadelphia in a most deplorable condition. One of the Quakers who visited the boats while they were in quarantine reported that they were without shirts and socks and were sadly in need of a bedcloth and a petition to the governor given an account of their conduct in Acadia and of the treatment they had received fell on deaf ears. An act was passed for their dispersion in the counties of Bucks, Lancaster, and Chester. The refugees, however, were not without friends. So several Quakers, they were indebted for many acts of kindness and generosity. Now, why were the Quakers helping these people a lot? Now, remember who else the Quakers in history were helping, right? Weren't they helping runaway slaves in the Underground Railroad? Quakers? They're also helping Acadians who are going north to Canada. Hmm, what a coincidence. What does it say here? Port Royal of Acadia. Upon their arrival at the ports where they were dumped off in Louisiana, they quickly assembled in small groups to attempt a recapturing their lives and regrouping their families. They were not wanted by the people among which they were deposited and they were forbidden to form large groups. This forced them into small clusters, among which an information pipeline was formed to pass word along as to who was where and what was happening. So again, why were these places they were being done? Why did they care so much for them to get into large groups and unite? You got to understand that. Why were they afraid of all these Moors? Why was they afraid of all these Muslim Moors as a farty Jews to get together, huh? Huh? These so-called black people to come together, huh? Why were they so afraid of that? This forced them into small clusters among which all an information pilot was formed. This news highway soon became highly developed with information being passed among the colonies and by ship sailors to other parts of the continent. It can be said with a high degree of reliability 
that from day of deposit on a strange shore, the Acadians continually attempted a regrouping and going back to the homeland they had been exiled from. They were trying to go back home, not because they were trying to go to freedom. They were trying to go back home. And listen to this, all right? Major drop. By spring of 1756, an underground highway leading north, perhaps the model of the Negro Underground Railroad during the American Civil War had been established with Acadians skirting the coastline of the Carolinas, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, and New Jersey. All right. The model for the Negro Underground Railroad. All right. That was the model for the fake story. You get it? That's the model. That's what they used as the source for their fairy tales of African slaves running away, Harriet Tubman, all that stuff. This is the real story I'm telling you right now. All right? These fairy tales are based on real events. They add a lot of hijack. They give you a little bit of truth, but add a lot of hijack. All right? But this is the model for the Negro Underground Railroad. The Canadians going back home north, not because they were seeking freedom, because the north was free states. No, the north had so-called indentured servants to slaves. Don't get fooled. The Acadian exiles or French neutrals in Pennsylvania. All right, this is what we were just reading about. The wishes appended a relation of their misfortunes by John Baptist Galerm. I am proud to say that in their relation to those unfortunate fugitives, all right, fugitives, runaways, right, fugitive, I find on the records of the popular representative body no trace of the malignant animosity and sectarian antipathy which extuated the executive. He's saying, I don't see no reason why they're messing with these people. Painfully impracticable as Penn's principles had shown themselves when applied to periods of war and invasion and danger from the strong and armed hand without yet when when the homeless fugitive and stranger came and asked a place of refuge, the beautiful feature of the Quaker character, charity in its highest sense, and charity too, which knows no difference of creed, seem more beautiful than ever. The great principle of liberty of conscience and the totalization was put in practice towards the exiled papist. And it certainly is very hard with this unquestioned report before us that the friends of Pennsylvania should be nowadays charged with mercenary inhumanity. But our meager records show that there was another influence in favor of the exiles. There were hereditary national, hereditary, listen to this, there were hereditary national sympathies at work aside from all matters of technical religion, which gave the French exiles in Philadelphia a welcome that they had no right to expect. They're letting you know they had a common hereditary, all right, an ancestry. That's why they were being helped in Pennsylvania or by these people. Papas or not, they were French men and women and children, and they were in Quaker garb. And they were in Quaker garb. Again, all right, big one right there. These Acadians who were runaways, runaways, fugitives, they had Quaker clothing on. All right, and who was in Pennsylvania? Quakers, right? Same people, because eventually they go back to crypto, crypto, Secret Jews, secret Muslims, pretending to be Christians under tags like Quaker, Huguenot, Protestant, Presbyterian, Baptist, and so on and so on. All right, so the Huguenot Quaker, all right, the Huguenot, I can't get any more clear than that, was helping other Huguenots. The Acadians, these refugees, these French exiles, they ancestry was huguenot they were the same people i just wanted to show you guys that we're going to go right back to the book we were reading continue reading the chapter and read it all i uh, just wanted to go off and remind every everybody what we have gone over had gone over in my acadian video make sure to catch the full video if you haven't this is the thumbnail for it all right who are the cajuns all right now that you understand who the quakers are and a little better too as well